times. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for these students. Uh, thank you for their willingness to be here, to learn, uh, to grow, to continue to be diligent in their work, uh, even when it's not easy, even when um, they're alone and, and they don't have the, the company of their uh, classmates. I thank you that uh, they are willing to continue to um, work at everything with all their hearts. It is a blessing to me, and I know it's a blessing to your heart as well, Father. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we've got two more needing to be admitted. Yeah. Uh, so as I said, uh, we're on page 313. I'll read uh, the introduction aloud as I as I always do, and then we'll uh, start working on the, the student work. Creative work of the spirit. Other things maintain life. He gives life. Who would put anything in a balance with the deity? Who would weigh a feather against a mountain of gold? It's Thomas Watson. Traditional philosophies often defined beauty as an expression of two qualities, order and meaning. From this perspective, an object or a picture is beautiful to the extent, extent that it artfully expresses the message of its maker. A person is therefore beautiful because he or she reflects the image and work of the creator. Modern philosophers, however, often define beauty simply as attractiveness. With this view, we call things beautiful because we want to possess or consume them, or otherwise be near them. We can find this kind of beauty not only in high art, music, or nature, but also in a random splatter of paint on the wall. The modern, this modern sense of beauty explored by Western artists and writers in the mid 20th century emphasizes the meaning interpreted by a work's audience, not its creator. A viewer or reader can decide what the work means and the author's intent is just one more opinion among many. This idea arose to acknowledge the fact that we all view beauty differently. However, this thinking also proved attractive to people who denied the existence of any higher meaning at all. When we no longer view the universe as a work of art by God, we tend to lower our expectations for art created by humans. Yet God is a master artist, a master storyteller, and a brilliant architect. No one compelled him to fill the universe with such terror and beauty. No one asked Jesus to teach in the form of stories and parables. No one could possibly imagine the complex expression of holiness, power, and goodness that is the gospel. <clears throat> God filled his word with poetry, psalms, prophecies, genealogies, letters of encouragement, arguments, debates, barely articulated descriptions of heaven, and even an entire book of songs celebrating the intimacy shared by a husband and a wife. God expressed his love and truth in all of this, and we cannot help but acknowledge the beauty of his work. The common response to beauty is to desire to create more. As we see beauty in nature and art, we want to capture some of that same good in our own work. As we see good, the goodness of God shining through people, we want to serve them. As the spirit illuminates, enlightens in other words, his truth in the word. We want to share that with tr that truth with others. This activity can involve study and hard work, but it's more than worth, worth it to become a vessel used by the master potter to magnify his majesty. So we'll start with the, the student work, uh, and it says this. The teacher's lesson for this chapter examines the Spirit's work primarily within creation. Here, we'll briefly cover his work in the Old Testament as well as his revelation of truth throughout the scriptures. The Spirit in the, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, selective in dwelling. Peter's sermon at Pentecost, that's in the New Testament, of course, marked the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit in believers. Before Pentecost, however, the Holy Spirit did not reside in all of God's people. He chose to select a few to demonstrate his power. And as I understand it, 
um, the Holy Spirit would come upon that person, not, not necessarily indwell that person, but come upon that person. The person would do the thing for which the Holy Spirit indwelled them, and then the Holy Spirit would not be upon that person. Does that make sense? So different than what we see in the New Testament. Uh, for each passage, write the name of the person said to be indwelled by the Spirit. Note that some of these statements were made by people who did not know God. So in, I'm going to read the first one to you. In Genesis 41, verses 25 through 38, it says this. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what, is about to do, what he is about to do. Seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after the, them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them, there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of the Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and, st coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish uh, through the famine. Oh, I go through 38. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? So who spoke the words saying that Joseph had the Spirit of God. Pharaoh, not uh, someone who believed in the one true God, but he rightly said that Joseph had the Spirit of God. So in that blank, you can write Joseph. Now I've done a lot of reading. So who would uh, be willing to read Numbers 27, 18? Thank you, Jada. Go ahead and read that. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man who is a man in whom the spirit is in the spirit and lay your hand upon him. So who in, who, in whom did the or on whom did the spirit come in this passage? Not a trick question. On Joshua, right? So you can write Joshua in that blank. Uh, who would like to read Daniel 4, 8? Thank you, Cheyenne. The last Daniel came in before me. He who was named Belteshazzar, after the name of God, and in whom is the spirit of holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, yeah, so Daniel was given the name Belteshazzar, but uh, he, it is Daniel on whom the spirit uh, came to, to rest. So Daniel in that one. Who would like to read uh, Judges 6.34? Go ahead, Liv, thank you. <clears throat> um, but the spirit of the Lord closed Gideon and sounded the trumpet in the 
uh, Bezirites were called out to follow him. Okay, so Gideon. And then 1 Samuel 16, 13. Thank you, Jada. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Uh, so in that case, then it's David upon whom the spirit came to rest. So in Joseph, the spirit gave, uh, in, in, in Genesis, excuse me, the spirit gave Joseph the ability to uh, interpret Pharaoh's dream. And in um, Numbers, Joshua, the Spirit gave him the ability to lead the people. Uh, Daniel, again, uh, did a number of things, including interpreting dreams. Gideon beat the Midianite army with 300 men. God kept uh, weeding out the people in his army until he had 300 men. And they defeated the Midianite army without even... Um, without even any sort of fighting. The Midianites ended up killing each other. Uh, all they did was take some clay pots and some torches and some noisemakers, and they scared the heck out of the Midianites, and they killed each other. Isn't that great? With 300 guys. Um, God's spirit is, is wonderful. And then in 1 Samuel, uh, uh, David was anointed to lead his people by the spirit of God. Next page. Enablement for service. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit sometimes gave people special abilities to do impressive things. Now, it gives you the wrong thing to do here. So, uh, in, uh, in the, um, for each passage below, write what that person uh, did or what the, the God enabled that person to do uh, because their names are given. So I'm going to read Exodus 31. Uh, and I'm reading verses 1 through 3. One page back. And then it says, The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with the ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship to um, devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting of stones, for setting and in carving wood, to work in every craft. So God's spirit came on Bezalel in order to craft things. Uh, out of out of gold and bronze and uh, stones and and to make beautiful things by the power of his spirit and and those beautiful decorations uh, and instruments were intended for the tabernacle. Uh, he was one of the ones uh, who God gifted to uh, create um, things for the tabernacle. Now, who would like to read Judges 14, 5, and 6? Thank you, Cheyenne. Then Samson went down to Timonaha with his father and mother and came as far as the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came roaring toward him. The spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily so that he tore nothing in his hand and he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. So the spirit of God enabled, um, uh, excuse me, um, Sam Samson, I was going to say Samuel, to kill a lion with his bare hands. By the way, if you don't ever, if you, I've probably told you this before, but if you ever don't know how to pronounce uh, something in the Bible, just make it up. Nobody's gonna know the difference. Nobody, if, if you just act like you know what you're saying, trust me, I do that with Greek and Hebrew all the time. So uh, you didn't know that, did you? I do. Uh, some of them I know, but not all of them. <clears throat> in the New Testament and today, 
the Holy Spirit serves to communicate the work and character of God. Match each passage below with the name it gives the Spirit. So who would like to read John 14, 17? Liv, thank you. And while she's looking that up, who wants to um, look up Romans 1? Thank you, Cheyenne. By the way, those of you who don't have your video on, you can give me a thumbs up if you're willing to read something. Thanks, Josh. We'll give you Romans 8, too. Liv, go ahead. All right. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be with you. So Liv, the, what name is the spirit given there? Um, the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. So C. Uh, Romans 1, 4. Cheyenne? Who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, so in the spirit of holiness be there. Uh, and uh, I saw your thumbs up, Mary. Thank you. I'll have you do Romans 8.15. Josh, could you read Romans 8.2? Uh, yeah, hang on. Let me unmute. The law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ has made, have made me free from the law of sin and death. I'm sorry, can you read that again? Romans 8, 2. The law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear the spirit of life thing. Yes, so D, okay. the spirit of life. Uh, and then Mary, Romans 8, 15. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Um, that's the wrong verse. Yeah, let's go with four, uh, with 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Hey, that other verse was great. Everyone needed to hear it, so that's fine. Uh, spirit of adoption, E. By the way, Abba means daddy, so by which we cry, daddy. Uh, who wants to do Ephesians 1.7? Liv, are you willing to do that? Thank you. That the um, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of re uh, revelation in the knowledge of him. Great. So F, spirit of wisdom. And then Hebrews 10, 29. Thank you, Peyton. Okay. Just... Think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled uh, on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant, which made us holy as if it were common and unholy, and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. So, spirit of mercy or spirit of grace, depending on which version you're reading. So, uh, A for uh, 1029, Hebrews 1029. Now, we're going to talk about a couple of definitions, uh, revelation and inspiration. Uh, so the two terms can enhance our appreciation for God's word. Revelation is the disclosure of previously unknown truth. Uh, the term can also refer to specifically, refer specifically to the truth revealed. So this is new information not previously made known. And you may want to write that down to it. Uh, new information, not previously known. And then next to that, write 1 Corinthians 15, 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. So new information, not previously known.
And in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, uh, Paul says, listen, or, or, or uh, behold, I tell you a mystery. And that word mystery is mysterion in the Greek. And it means new revelation. I tell you something new. This is something that pre wasn't previously known. And he goes on to say, we won't all die. And then he talks about what is commonly called the rapture. Um, but uh, the time when Jesus will return and, and take, you know, as he says, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds and forever and uh, we will be with the Lord forever. So this was new information, never been heard before. This was a revelation from God. Now, sometimes it also, it says, it can refer to the revelation itself, to uh, what is the, the new um, information itself, as in the book of Revelation. That is an entirely new revelation from God. And so that that book is itself it's called revelation but it is itself a revelation that, that had never been previously understood the stuff in in the book of revelation so that's revelation uh inspiration is god's work through human authors so that as they wrote with their own perspective and personality they recorded god's revelation without error so God inspires people to do his work. Uh, and, and, and most specifically, it refers to those who wrote the Bible that were inspired by God to write what they wrote. Um, you uh, probably know 2 Timothy 3.16, for all scripture is God breathed, inspired. That word inspire, talk, it, it means to breathe. So it is God inspired. It is God breathed. Uh, and uh, so that revelation is new work uh, or new knowledge and inspiration is empowering people to write what God wants them to write or do what God wants them to do. So revelation is therefore the truth that God gave us and inspiration refers to the manner in which he gave that truth to us. Now let's talk about authorship. The Spirit, as God, is the author behind the revelation and inspiration of Scripture. He is the reason for the what and the how of the Bible. Uh, match each passage below with the truth it teaches. So I'm going to read 2 Samuel 23. Second Samuel 23, uh, verses 1 and 2. One more page. Now these are the last words of David. The oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of God, of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks to me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God. Uh, so what truth is David through the Holy Spirit uh, teaching in that passage? B. B, that the spirit of the Lord spoke to him. And the Spirit of the Lord speaks uh, to people. Uh, and then who would like to read Acts 28, 25? Thank you, Cheyenne. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul and spoke and one party Oh, 
Is my audio working? Yeah, the audio kind of blipped out there. My, it says my internet connection is stable. It might kick us all off, but just hang on. It'll come back if that happens. You want to try reading that again, Cheyenne? Yeah. Verse 28. Therefore, let it be known to you that salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. Okay, is that 28.25? Is that Acts 28.25? No. Good verse, did, though. <laughs> and when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul he had spoken one parting word. The Holy Spirit, right? We've spoken through Isaiah the prophet to his fathers. Okay, so uh, yeah, obviously that one's C, that uh, the Holy Spirit spoke through Isaiah. Who wants to read? Well, you don't have to read 2 Timothy uh, 3.16. I just quoted it. For all scripture is God-breathed and, and profitable for teaching, for training, for rebuking, uh, for teaching, for correcting, training, and rebuking. Uh, in, no, rebuking and training in righteousness. So um, that would be D, all scripture is inspired or God breathed. Who would like to read 2 Peter 1.21? Thank you, Jada. For no prophecy was ever produced by the, the will of men, but, the, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so obviously that's A, people spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So now it says means, and the means are the process by which this happens. So God used various means or ways to reveal his truth to people throughout the Bible. Read each passage below and write the method by which uh, God communicated his revelation. So who would like to read Genesis 20, verse 6? Liv? Okay, um, then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and it, and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. So what, did, what was the, uh, the method there that God spoke? Um, in a dream. In a dream. Uh, and then Exodus 19.9. I'd like to read that. Thank you, Jada. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear you when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. So God's speaking to Moses and he says, I'm going to come to you in a thick cloud and talk to you. Uh, and the people will be able to hear that. So a voice from a cloud. And then who would like to read Isaiah 1 1? Thank you, Marcus. All right, now I have a point click. All right. The vision of the sight of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Judy. Yeah, so a vision. I, God came to Isaiah and gave him a vision. And then John 1, 14, part of the passage you will be memorizing next year. John. Thank you, Jada. Go ahead. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son of Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So who's the word? God. Jesus himself. Jesus is. So in the person of Christ, uh, God revealed uh, his salvation through the person of Christ. Now, I don't entirely agree with the next statement, so I'm going to kind of give you some, um, the word I'm thinking of is mollifying, but I know you don't know what that means. So I'm going to give some context to that. By the way, there'll be some things in the upcoming chapters with which I disagree as well, um, and, uh, and that's okay, because what I believe and what the book believes, a Christian can believe. Um, I, just, I just know that some of you are going to disagree with the book, and I want to make sure you know you're not alone. So, uh, but here's the thing for now. 
Since we now have the sufficient word of God today, we need not rely on visions or voices to know God's truth. And, and that's speaking for us here in America. We have the truth of God readily available to us. But some people do need visions. And in fact, we're getting stories, hearing stories, particularly from closed countries in the Middle East and in Asia, where people are seeing visions of Jesus and he is beckoning them to come to him. And people are coming to Christ without missionaries, without the Bible, because of these visions and these dreams. Um, so uh, I believe that people still today still do have visions and st do, still do have dreams that come from God, um, and particularly where God's word is not available. Where God's, where access to the truth is not readily available. So I don't want you to get the idea that when it says uh, we don't need them today, that there is no such thing as visions and and uh, and revelation from God. Uh, so uh, we need not rely on visions or voices to know God's truth. The scriptures are themselves a miracle, a sign that God loved us enough to uh, preserve his message and truth through the centuries, through the countless manuscripts transcribed and compiled by imperfect people. His word has nonetheless remained true and sure, and we can, uh, great, gratefully, uh, we can read gratefully of his grace. One last thing, I just used the word revelation. I do believe that there is now no longer a need for new revelation. Um, because we have the, the canon, we have the Bible. Uh, now, there's we learn new things, and something can be a revelation to us, but in terms of communicating totally brand new truth, um, I think that that's, that's probably no longer necessary. Even the people that are having visions, they're not learning new truth. That's truth that has been around. Um, but uh, there are, I'm sure there are Christians that disagree with that as well, and, and that's fine. So, questions on any of this? None? Okay. Well, uh, I, it's great to see your faces, those faces I can see. Uh, it's, it's, for me, it's just as wonderful to hear your voices. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, I haven't, haven't heard your voices in, in a long time, so uh, it's a blessing for me to, to hear your voices as well. Uh, and I'm praying for you. I miss you, and uh, I am hoping that that you're not overwhelmed. If you are overwhelmed, feel free to call, text, uh, and or email me, and I'll do my best to help you through uh, whatever you're you're overwhelmed by. Okay. I miss you all. Uh, go to go to chapel in about 25 minutes. Okay. Oh, that's, that's today. That's today. That's today. <laughs> Okay, good to see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Be the same. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>